through the course, obviously. So I'm just here to, you know, figure, figure out what's going on. So. <laughs> Excellent. How about you, Ted? Um, I, I, I'll be covering the McGraw-Hill content and how to, to pair and sync the courses and activate the McGraw-Hill assignment links. Excellent. And Jerry? I'm an instructor with questions to be answered. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Jerry, questions. <laughs> oh. oh, great. We're going to get them all answered. We're going to, it's going to happen. All right. Uh, I'm Justin. I'm the instructional designer on the project. I oversee social sciences, uh, pretty much all of them, um, through just maintaining the course. I don't develop every single one of them, but uh, I've been on a lot of those projects. And um, Nicole, if you want to give yourself a quick intro, um, I'll, I'll go over a quick agenda for the recording and then we'll uh, go from there. Well, yeah, I'm Nicole Duttlinger. I did the redevelopment and now I'm the mentor for all the political science instructors. And uh, I, I piloted PAC back spring 2020. So I've been using it a long time uh, at this point and love it. And then uh, getting to work with Connect, I'm super excited because it's all in this like one spot, we're not all over the internet. So I'm, I'm hoping that'll help streamline it for the students and take off some of that cognitive overload that I think they were getting. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, Nicole. Well, uh, this is our first ever uh, non-instruction week where we were doing these instructor webinars. So um, for, for Jerry and Shannon and, and Nicole too, if you have any feedback on this as an instructor teaching a course, what was useful, what wasn't. Um, for me personally, that would be great. Um, so feel free to reflect on it. You don't have to give it to me, to me today. But really today we're focusing on the publisher content um, and how to set it up uh, properly. What questions do you have for it? Um, before I hand it over, I, I figured I would show you guys just a few things. Uh, and then I'd hand it over to uh, Ted and Dave that they can show you the pairing process for uh, McGraw-Hill Connect. And then from there, we'll pass it over to Sarah and she can show you how to get, get packed back uh, figured out. So first off, I just wanted to sh plug a couple things that are super um, helpful for Nicole and I um, in, in the course. Uh, first off, the report course issues button. If you if you run into any issues with the course, um, please report it here. This is a, our easy way to document and track and make sure that questions get answered and things don't float um, out in a nebulous of you know nothingness. That we if it gets reported here, it will be taken care of. We will get get in contact and uh, we we try to track how long it takes to get those resolutions done too. So that way we can improve our processes. So please use that link when you when you do run into anything. Um, and then, you know, at the towards the end of the course, uh, please fill out this faculty evaluation of course design link. This is a survey that Nicole and I will go over to to see um, what all the instructors thought about the course and its design. And obviously, everybody wants the course to be the, be the best that it can be. So uh, I think the faculty um, perspective on that is super important. Um, so that's there too. I know Nicole's added some some other uh, instructions on here that are super helpful, like the links to the purple instructor text. Uh, that was really like an easy way to get to navigate around the course. Um, there's some instructions here for the live assignment. This is something that was kind of added to every Ivy Online course. So there's just some direction in there um, that can help with setting that up. Uh, the instructor guide has lots of good information for you. Uh, and then lastly, and and I think this would be great in in like week seven or week eight, but there's a student course evaluation link down here. We also want the student uh, perspective on here. So if if you all could, you know, push that towards the end of the week as a reminder and an announcement or, uh, you know, any way that you could help encourage students to take that, uh, to, to fill out that survey for um, just feedback on the course. Cause we want, we want, we don't know everything. We want all the data that we can so we can, um, make the course the best that it can be. So uh, I'll go ahead and, and stop there. That's my little plug uh, for a couple things on here. Um, you know, if you ever have any questions about uh, the course, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I know, I know Nicole's open to questions too. She's already fielded so many in the last couple of days. I, so she's, she's working hard. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over uh, to Ted. Um, uh, can I just interrupt? Um, oh, sure. Real quick, the, the live instructor meeting, I just, I put up an announcement Mm -hmm. uh, to call attention to uh, a part of it to erase, like to delete. Uh, they have where the meeting can count for the drop ad and we need to take that out of there because uh, we had discussed that having just that one assignment, the interactive study guide counts mm -hmm. 
on June 10th, it's due. It's for the drop ad. Nothing else is because the students get too confused and then instructors are trying to keep track. Well, did somebody post a question on face on Packback, but then they didn't do anything else or were they at the meeting or were they not at the meeting? Sure. And so um, that interactive study guide is the only thing that counts. And so the language needs to be removed from the that introductory meeting and then also from the syllabus. And I did put that in announcement for people, but for anybody watching this video, the recording, I wanted them to double check that. Okay. Thanks, Nicole. All right. Um, Ted, you want to take, uh, I think I'm I'll share my screen. Yep. And now everybody should see the Political Science 101 course in Ivy Learn. Okay, thanks, Justin. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, um, a lot of the content and assignments in the course are in our system Connect. And so those all these assignments are contained in a Connect course. And so that's a one-to-one -one matching with this Ivy Learn course. So each instructor will get copied out to us kind of behind the scenes, a Connect PolySci 101 course. And all that needs to be done uh, to activate the assignment links that are already in Ivy Learn that Nicole placed there is to pair a connect course and then do a synchronization. It's a two-step process and that's what I'm going to go through. It's very easy um, and, and I'll show you how to do it now. So it, when you go into your course, if you go to the McGraw-Hill connect button on the left, it's going to ask you if you want to pair with a connect section. And I'll choose yes. Uh, and the most important part of this, because we've already copied out a connect section for you, is to choose to pair a section in an existing connect course. A little bit, in some ways, counterintuitive because you would want to say it's a new course, but you've already got a course waiting for you. So it's an existing course. And so you will not have a million demo courses in here like I do. I'll scroll down to political science. Apologize for this because I have a demo course for literally everything that we have. And you'll want to find the one that's labeled POLS 101 Summer 2021 and click that. And you'll have on this next screen, this pop-up window, a section with your, with your section number. It'll be pre-labeled and ready and waiting for you. And then you just click save. So that's step one. That's easy. You're almost done. After that, all you have to do is click return to Ivy Learn. And you can click it here or the yellow bar on the left. And now you can see that my connect section is paired with my Ivy Learn course. That's good. That's what you want. Now you just need to click sync. And so what it's going to do is it's going to spin and look for a minute. And then it's going to find the connect assignments. It's essentially finding the assignment links in Ivy Learn that need to be reactivated and deployed. And so when you finish this, you click submit. And it'll tell you that you're done. You'll click OK. Uh, and then if you want to take one more step just to see that everything is the way that it should, you can either go over to the left and go into the modules, and we'll do that. Uh, or you can click go to my connect section here. I'm going to go to my connect section first and show you what it looks like. So this is our system connect. And you can see if everything's the way it should be, there'll be a red icon, which is the, the canvas icon next to each assignment. So there are interactive study guides and you can see these are all synchronized. That means that it's one to one with canvas. So as students go in and do the assignments in Ivy Learn, that means that the grades are automatically going to feed. You don't need to do anything. They synchronize immediately after the students do them. Um, so everything from the quizzes, the study guides, uh, case study, um, there's a simulation. The simulations automatically, it takes care of all that and sends the grades. There's nothing you need to do manually. Um, and then I'll go back to Ivy Learn and show you if you want to do a check. If you go to the modules or assignments, 
So if I went to modules and if we go down to, let's say a quiz. Well, this is a, yep. This means, so if you see this connect window come up, that means everything is functioning as it should. So it takes you automatically into, into instructor view. But if you wanted to see what students see, you could click the preview button here. That's the process that you need to do. Very simple, that's it. Take, should take you a minute or two to do it. Um, the only other thing that you might do if you wanted to change any of these dates, if you go back to connect, you can check the boxes next to assignments. And then above that, there's a, what I call the stack of papers icon. I don't know that there's really a technical term for it, but I've named it the stack of papers. <laughs> you can go there and then click manage dates and you can change any connect assignment dates that you would want to. And then they automatically go over to, to Canvas, to Ivy Learn. Uh, but that's it. Uh, any questions on that process? So just oh. to be clear, they don't have to sync again ever if correct, like to make grades go over. No, uh, when the way our system works and the way the integration with Canvas with Ivy Learn works, each time a student, an individual student does work, then it sends that data over it pretty much immediately. You don't have but to, you don't have to do periodic synchronization. Now, if okay. you ever... If you ever do say, okay, look, there's something that looks like it's missing, uh, then you can do a synchrony. You can go into to connect. You can go here. And you can hit this sync button and it won't hurt anything. Um, but uh, usually if you get a question from a student that uh, like their a grade is not, they don't, they don't see a grade in Canvas, it's usually because they've done the work late. Um, and at that point you can give them an extension and I can show you how to do that. And that's also the, in, in the instructor guide, but that's generally the only other thing that you'll have to do. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Um, this is all I, very clear and straightforward after I've done it once, but, um, what do we see from the students, you know, where this says no students work that one mm -hmm. page you showed us. Sure. What when 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 their students work in there? What are we going to see? You can are we going to see their that. name and click their name and see the work they did, or what? You know, sure, how do we absolutely. interact with their work? You know, so the so. grades, so anything that's that's auto graded, uh, you don't really need to do anything. It'll go to the Ivy Learn grade book. Okay. Is it over there automatically? Now, if you want to go into well, let's go to one of this and, and we can talk about it in context. So I think it's a great, it's a great question. So if you yeah. want to see, like these interactive study guides are adaptive. So it's, it's essentially adaptive reading with quizzing built into it. And if you click on this from the instructor view, once students start to work on it, there's all kinds of reporting in here. So you could even drill down and see if certain students or the class as a whole are having difficulty with certain topics. And so there would be a reporting dashboard, essentially, Shannon, to answer your question that would fill in here that you could drill into if you want to. So it won't be like individual students' names that I'd click on to see the work. It's going to be an analytical thing. It's both. Okay. You can see it okay. at the individual student. You could see it at the student level. You could see it at uh -huh. the topic level, or you could see it at the class level. Okay. And now, is it going to be clear, and this is a question to kind of the designer guys too, um, is it going to be clear, I'm, I'm still very unsure about what I'm correcting and what um, McGraw, the McGraw-Hill thing is, you know, system is correcting. So is Nicole, everything is in McGraw-Hill being corrected? Uh, so anything with McGraw-Hill, I made it uh, auto graded. The whole purpose was to get the load off of you all. So they get feedback from the system. So say they're doing this interactive study guide and they have an issue with the concept. It gives them, it tells them, hey, let's go back to this part of the book. Let's reread this section to help you understand this concept better. 
and then they go back through it. So uh, that way you all didn't have to go and give a lot of feedback. And uh, so these McGraw-Hill stuff is mostly, uh, I guess the best way to think about a lot of it is it's like that first couple of rungs of scaffolding for the other projects. So a lot of the times like they'll go in here and it explains to them how to read a court case and then it asks them questions, it's auto graded, then that sets them up for when they go and they read the two court cases that they then write about. So I'm using Connect to do a lot of that, uh, that initial basic scaffolding that gives them the really good base to then move into the rest of the assignments. So you shouldn't really, it's good to come and look at the analytics because yes, if I'm seeing, wow, everybody's bombing this one part of you know an assignment, then that's a time for me to put something in the announcements or maybe some supplemental resources. Uh, but to actually go in one by one and give feedback on these is was not my plan. Okay. So for, for Nicole, for our purposes, then we're really, our grading is mainly going to be at the projects. The, Correct. It, yeah, I think okay. I counted up, it's eight or nine assignments that we really get in there and grade, because you'll see with Packback, it makes grading way easier as well. So okay. uh, that way we could actually spend time looking at these analytics, seeing where they are struggling, finding the struggling student that's not logging on and contacting them, uh, giving really good feedback on those projects and the larger papers that are really getting them uh, to do really well with critical thinking and actually looking at political science theory. And so that's, the, that's where I was hoping we could shift some of our focus instead of grading all these little things. Great. Thank it, you, both of you. Interactive study guides even, the, it, it highlights what they need to read. And then based on how they answer the questions in the follow-up to that reading, it changes the highlighting and then directs them to what they need to do based on, on how they're doing. It really individualizes the study and, and reading experience for them. Oh, great. And That's grades really all of that, great. so. Great, great. Thank and you both. Really cool, because when he does the next edition, he looks at what the analytics of these interactive study guides tells him. So, cause as they adapt, then he, when he sees issues, he can then fix the textbook to be even better the next edition. Yeah, it provides granularity to the author. So they get, they get feedback down to the paragraph level uh, that perhaps this paragraph is not written as well as it should be, or you need to think about explaining this concept in a different manner. Um, and so it makes the, the textbook revision process completely different than it really ever has been. So. Oh, all very interesting. Thank you both. Sure. Answers my question. So. Okay. Great question. Thank you. And then Ted, is the, the proctor settings I set for quizzes, did that copy to everybody or do they need to go for add some are, For some or they will need to, they'll need to do it. Are you able to show them that then, please? Sure. Which one is it? Is it the are the quizzes? Uh, yeah, it's on the quizzes. Okay. So to set proctoring on a quiz, you would click on the quiz. Sorry, I got to move my Zoom window around, and then you can click edit. And you can see Nicole's already got instructions in here, but you would just click continue. And this screen has proctoring. So you could enable the proctoring if you want to here. Yeah, we want all of them to do it. So, um, but we take off the record video. We don't do that. Okay. And then we go for go. Uh, control access to other apps and websites. And if you want, if you want to change the level, you can change it here. Yeah. And so then for this one, I think I made it moderate. No, I made it, I made it strict because I didn't want them to use, we don't want them using other websites. This is to protect our question banks and protect our questions. Um, 
So instructors need to do this. And then that's, I left that there. Uh, so that one's done then. And then, quick save. and then I would have put on, there was one other that I put on too. Which one? So I think you press done. And so then, to clarify, which three do we need to do? Uh, and then this control content. Uh, and I disabled all these, except the blocking the downloads because we don't. I I don't think we have access to plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're. And then I hit done. And then that's that's what we set for ours. Okay. And then you have then, to do that on each and every quiz. But by fall, we won't have to do that. That's correct. And then you just click. You need to make, when you do that, just make sure you click through the and click assign so that it saves that setting. And then would they need to resync after changing all those quizzes? Nope. That'll, it'll take care of itself. Awesome. Yeah, one one last little inter interjection with uh, the pairing process. Uh, a common issue that we've seen is uh, people try to log in with a personal email account. Um, McGraw Hill knows who is teaching the course with an attached Ivy Tech email account, so you have to make sure you log in with your Ivy Tech email. Um, and you can see that it'll it'll have like if you're logged in as somebody as a different email that you have, it'll say off to the side. Um, like when you first click on McGraw Hill Connect, it'll say like, "Hey, uh, you're auto lo logged in as this guy." So if you are having issues, like if you log in, you can't find the Pulse Summer one like uh, one one course. A lot of times, it's because you've been logged in with a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or something like that, um, and you just got to make sure that the first time you you go in, you log in as your Ivy Tech, um, or if you accidentally logged into something else, you can you know de-link your account and re-sign in as Ivy Tech. Yeah. Well, any other questions for uh, Ted? All right. Well, thank you, Ted. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks, thank Nicole, you. too, for going through some of that with us. I really appreciate it. So um, at this point, let's uh, pass it over to Sarah. Excellent. So, hey, everybody, uh, for those who I haven't met yet, my name is Sarah. I am the executive curriculum consultant um, at PACPAC, and I support Ivy Tech in implementing student-led discussion. Um, so with this, um, Nicole and I are actually going to partner together and showing you how to activate PACPAC in your classroom. So um, for this, Nicole, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, it's very simple to add pack back to your course. And I wanna make sure we all get a chance to do it at this time. Awesome. I'm changing my share. And similarly, um, we are LTI integrated. So we have single login. So when students click on the pack back link, they're, the first time they click, it actually generates their account. So. Uh, Nicole already has packback questions here, but I just want to show you quickly if you don't see packback questions on the left hand side. Actually, oh, they will. Justin, they will. now that I'm saying, yep, they will. <laughs> yep. You, yep, never mind. You, you all, uh, I forgot we had touched base on that. So, what you want to do is go ahead and click on the left hand side where it says packback questions. And I'm to make it as easy as possible. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. So what happens here? Nicole already has an account. Yep. So you will see the screen that says create a new community. And so you want to click on that blue button because that is creating your own unique packback community. And there's just a few details we ask to fill out just to make sure that, um, again, there's proper sync here. So polls 101. You can put your max enrollment here. Yep. And then y'all end the 31st of July, right? Uh, yeah. Did I put in? Yes. Yep. 
Yes. And then ours and then, is, I believe, 19% of our grade. 19. Okay, excellent. And then the only thing I would just confirm before we go ahead, where it says Tuesday, June 1st. So we automatically, uh, when you're creating the pac community, we just denote that as the first date. But you might want to update it to say June 6th, or excuse me, June 7th, if that's when pac will become available to students. Well, they have, um, they're able to log on starting June 5th to look at things. Perfect. So I'll make it, I think we should probably make it June 5th then. Excellent. Excellent. So go ahead and press save and continue. And with this, it has created your Packback community. So it will allow that single log on for students. And uh, this will be a triple check right here and you would press go to community. Now, I do wanna preface from, um, yep, you can just click go ahead or go to community. Where do you want me to go? Sorry. It, see that blue button where it says go, yep, perfect. Like All right, this. so I think my my video was a little behind, but you're, oh. you're good now. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what I do wanna preface is that you're seeing from the professor end, when your students initially log into PackBack, they will also get a tutorial on how to ask great questions on PackBack because we're all we're focused on open-ended inquiry to drive discussion and debate forward versus just a closed-ended using this platform, you know, as a closed-ended kind of Google search. So Nicole, I'm just gonna scroll, if you could scroll down, I want to show quickly the tutorial. Oh, okay. I was going to walk up yeah. to your set up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I just want to make sure for the uh, students. The yep, tutorial. Just, yep. Just scroll down slightly and it will say tutorial. Why am I not seeing it? Go up slightly. Keep going, keep going. Oh, that's it. Yeah, open the pack back tutorial. So again, this is what your students will see. And I wanna make sure that again, you have uh, context to what they're seeing when they first log in. So this video, um, you can watch on your own time, but it's just talking about the power of questions. Now, what makes pack back different is that we are an AI powered discussion platform. So our AI supports students in writing questions of higher levels of loops. So our AI looks for elements that could detract or close a conversation. So for instance, um, class logistics, right? It's not really contributing to the academic nature that we're hoping to contribute on this platform. So a question that would be flagged by our AI would be, when is the next test? Because it's not necessarily furthering academic dialogue. Similarly here, we teach them what a great question looks like on Packback so that they have the context as well. Just press, I understand these guidelines. And again, the students have to choose what the best question is. So this is a great way to take the burden off of you in terms of teaching them how to use content and giving them this uh, more asynchronous tutorial. Great. Any questions, Shannon or Jerry, about what students experience when they first log into Packback? And then we'll get into community setup. Oh, I think you're on mute, Shannon. My <laughs> question, my questions are more about how it functions. So okay. like, you know, like the, the, the students give each other spark points, then they get five E, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So those spark yeah. points, so the students are in effect grading each other. They're not points. Sparks are the equivalent of a like on Facebook or Instagram. So it's more or oh. less just saying, oh, I'm interested in this. So it's bringing their attention. It would not affect their grade in the end. Oh, okay. Because yep. I was like, hmm, I could see where that could go wrong. I could see where that could really go wrong. Yep, so Lord okay. Flies are going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. <laughs> I'm a little bit more comfortable with it now, thank you. So, yes, um, no problem. But I need to, I, I need to get into the setup of it before, yeah. you know, I think my other questions are relevant. I mean, Perfect. that was before, that, that, was, that was the cart before the horse kind of question too, so. 
totally so, fine. So um, I like to just start at this first one. Like I know I don't have teaching assistants, but I like to mm -hmm. start there because I like going down a list. It makes me feel good. <laughs> so check the box. I, and of course I mark, I don't have teaching assistants. And then, you know, save and continue. And then uh, you can actually split them into groups. I've never done it. Um, I've thought about doing it because I've read more and more research about having only five or six in a group. Um, so I'm thinking about maybe trying it myself, but for instructors, uh, especially if it's your first time using it, I yeah. would just go with full class view and not worry about sections. So I'm not using sections. And then I we have the once every week, so it's weekly. Uh, mine are due on Monday night. And I usually set it at like 1am just because some people get on there a little after midnight and I don't care. And I don't want to see my, uh, I don't want to have my report all messed up because if they post after then my, then that question or replies will go on the next week's report. So I like to set mine, you know, later in the morning kind of thing. Uh, just because it doesn't really bother me if they got on there at like 12.05 and put it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it, isn't that like Monday morning? I guess it would be Tuesday, right? Yeah, yeah. there we go. And you then, can also yep. say you don't want the automatic ones, but I like them. Mm -hmm. And so then you see these are our due dates, the ones I set. Some people have their set for Sunday due dates. I like I have mine set for Monday due date. So it's whatever you as the instructor want to do. Is, mm -hmm. is Nicole, can any, I just, oh, go ahead, go ahead, is, there, go ahead. is there any way to change just one of those to like account for the the one holiday we have where Monday is a holiday and Tuesday mm -hmm. would be the due date? Uh, is there? So would you be skipping a week or you would just be extending the just, deadline just by one, a day? By one day for one week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I would recommend, it's called the custom date range report um, versus changing the automatic grade, grading reports because at this time, it would retroactively affect every single um, period up until that point. So to pull a custom date range report, um, you go to view gradebook and there is a tab that just says custom grades and you pull or you put in the dates that you're looking for and then it will create it from there, but it won't impact students' views of their previous grades and it won't affect your gradebook moving forward. Um, yeah, and the students don't see this. This is just us that sees it as well. So it's not like they're going to think that their due date is these. They, won't, they only know their due dates based on what Canvas tells them. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was driving what was, they were seeing for that section, like in their own scores. No, uh, -uh. Okay. Um, and then I'll show you how to do the custom date report too. Yeah. It's really easy. Yep. Okay, Excellent. Nicole, so, I just want to clarify. Can I just clarify something with Nicole first? Uh -huh. So Nicole, you're, you're having pack back due on a different date than the other, the um, quizzes and the projects, correct? No, all my stuff is due Monday at 1159. So you're keeping that Monday due date. Okay, so yeah. everything mm -hmm. for the student is the same because I thought yes. that would be get kind of confusing if I had a different due date for them. That would be too much for them to kind of manage in their mm -hmm. schedule. Oh so, yeah, okay, no, perfect. Like going crazy. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you just using the Monday due date. Okay, fine, mm -hmm. got it. Yeah, that's what the Student Government Association wanted instructors to use. So mm -hmm. I do that, but we're not bound by that. You can do whatever day you want. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, when I added the dates to Canvas, then I put Saturday as my due date, and then I add a reminder in on Monday so that they know to get their additional question in on Saturday. Oh, okay. That's smart. Um, I just tell them to do it, and then they tend to they tend to do well at getting that question up there. So, and I don't go, I don't and I try to tell, like, because it's like one of the best practices, I guess, with pack back is to try not to get, you know, try not to get too much to up to your elbows and things. So right. I don't go through and see, oh, was all questions on here before Saturday? Like, as they got a question up, they got a question up. I tell them to get it up by Saturday. 
the vast majority do. And I don't penalize them if they put it up on Sunday or Monday anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our biggest thing is that we, we want to have enough structure so students feel confident in the space, but not be overly prescriptive to where it becomes again, that call and response nature. Um, so yeah, Nicole, if you wanna go ahead with the set posting requirements. Yeah, I set it as points because that's what we calculated in the grade book. And then of course, this is all in that PowerPoint that they look at and that you all can look at to see uh, in case you, know, you forget after this or don't wanna go back to the video, but there's one question each question is worth 15. Um, we do set a minimum curiosity, which is um, 45 because that has seemed to work out the best um, with our poli-sci uh, classes. They, they, it's enough that they write really good questions and explanations, but it's not so much that they just give up and don't do it. So I found when I, I leave it at 45, I have not, messed with my participation rates. When you go any higher, it starts messing with participation rates. And one of the main reasons for discussion forums is to get them on there. Just the fact that they log on and interact gives them higher grades and higher completion rates. So we're just trying to, a lot of the times, get them on here, get them interacting. And if you go much higher than 45, they start uh, just not coming they just won't do it. And then they're missing that big reason we have discussion forums. And then I do give partial credit and instructors can really decide if they wanna do that, if they don't wanna do that. Uh, I like to give the partial credit because like I said, then that might get them to come back the next week. And then now they actually reach the curiosity score. So we're trying to motivate them to actually interact. And then it's, two responses and each of those is worth, is it five, I think? Five. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I don't set a minimum curiosity score for that. And then it's save and continue. Why is it not letting me, what did I do? Um, let's see. Should be. That point, 15. Just click out of the um, response box. I think that's why. Out of the, oh, duh. Just like, <sighs> oh, you're fine. <laughs> and then this, uh, I love, cause you can add this uh, syllabus statement. I always download this and then I add it to my syllabus. Uh, so I'm gonna skip this step for now though so that people don't have to see me do that, but uh, I always do add it to the syllabus. And so I would recommend that instructors do as well. I put it next to the book. Is that a good place for it? Uh, I put it in, I usually put it in the assignments I, like section, mm -hmm. but the book, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to have it in both places. Yeah, I'd recommend putting it in the assignment section, but it I don't think it's wrong if you put it somewhere else too, wherever it makes sense for you. That's and fine. then we don't have to worry about inviting students pack back because once they click, that's all done. So we just, I do not plan. And then you're, it says you're not quite done because uh, you can go post up some things. So I tend to, uh, I tend to write, I ask a new question Mm -hmm. And in here, I write, uh, I, I kind of re-give them the directions uh, here. So I'll say, are you, you know, are you ready to get curious and have fun? And then the description, I'll say, you know, have fun with this, stay within the topic of the module. I'll, I copy and paste those best tips that I have mm -hmm. uh, in Canvas, just kind of a reminder. And then um, I usually write, at the very top though in um, bold and cap locks, do not reply to this question because they'll start <laughs> putting their questions to my question. Um, so, and I make that first so they see it. And then I, you know, remind them of what they're doing and, uh, and then you're all done. I mean, it's pretty simple. Okay, so can we go back a step? So we don't have to invite students in here? No. Correct. 
it's already done. Once they click on pack back questions, it'll automatically put them into the class and then they're good to go. Okay, because we have language about them receiving an email and all this other stuff. And if we don't invite them, then they won't receive an email. It, is it in the syllabus, um, Jerry, I think, that, I think that language is? Yeah, and um, I can't remember where all it was, but I thought I saw it in a couple of places where it's telling them that they'll receive an email. And if they don't, then they have right. to talk to their instructor. So what I can do, um, I have more LTI facing directions. I think a, a lot of our schools are not LTI integrated or LMS integrated. So um, Nicole, would it be easier for me just to forward some language to you in terms of that sign on or um, I can also send um, yeah, that would directly be great. to Jerry. And I, that'd be great. And then I can post it and then I'll change it in the master. Yep. Perfect. Excellent. And then um, I think if we had time, we wanted to go over just some best practices. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, we get into those. Yep, that works. I'll go ahead actually and share my screen. Um, the only question that I had before moving on, um, and I'm actually about to show Nicole's previous community. So what you're seeing now actually is Nicole's uh, second term spring class. And right now I'm on presenter mode for FERPA compliance. But whenever you log on to PACMAC, what you'll see are students' names and their personalized avatars, which is really cool um, as a way to get to know students, um, especially if you're in an asynchronous class. So before scrolling down the feed, this is what Nicole was mentioning about an introduction um, post. So I'll just preview that quickly. And again, I love how it's not just about like, what is packback, but again, inspiring why are questions important when we're talking about political science. And obviously it's, these are hot button issues that continue to occur and rise uh, both in local state and federal government. So this is a great way, as Nicole said, to ask a question if you are going to do that. You want to do this particular action, which is pinning. Right now, you see this little pin at the top. That's because Nicole went into options, pin this. Now, if I clicked, it would unpin it, but she keeps the expectations at the top. And again, just to ensure what students should be doing while also mixing in that purpose. So if you need yeah, help, I had traffic. done that um, question because yeah, that's my. <laughs> I was like, oh wait, I did that. Yeah, because I like to give um, uh, like this is an example of one. Right. And so I would have added. I think if I remember right, I had it in Canvas that the penned question. Go ahead and look at it. It's one of mine. This is the kind of mm -hmm. thing I'm looking for. Yep. Excellent. So as you scroll through, what you'll see are students questions. So again, the best practice we have found is students ask one question and respond twice per week. And having that curiosity score minimum, as Nicole mentioned, it's a 45 minimum, that helps students aim towards an initial goal. But that isn't meant to deter or stop students from proceeding forward. I also want to mention that it is not a grade, it is simply an indication of academic behaviors. So in order to receive full credit, they do have to hit that 45 mark, but students again can go way above and beyond that. And with this, um, I also wanted to show the tools that are at your disposal. So if there's a particular concept or topic you're interested in, you can type in here and filter the feed by that particular term or concept. Also, we have this sorting tool. Now, Packback uh, automatically sorts by recent posts, but we have a bunch of different filters here, including Shannon, if you wanna see the most part sparked post, um, you can filter by most sparked post to see what your students thought was interesting. So again, a little gamification to get students involved. So these filters, I highly recommend playing around with whenever you have a week or two of content just to familiarize yourself. And the two I would recommend personally are hotness, which is a unique 
AI powered algorithm of the most recent, most active, and um, most popular in general. So it's a high quality post with a lot of responses. So this is a great one to give feedback to. Now, this is really the crux of that, which is to provide scalable feedback to students so you're not reading every single post. So with this one already being such high interest, as an instructor, I can click in and better understand you know, what I'm working with. So this is a great question to put your two cents um, forward. So you wanna go to options, give feedback. Now, how we scale feedback is through public praise. Public praise is when you're interacting with one post, but it's actually visible to all students. So personally, I would recommend if you're publicly praising a post, you'll want to feature, which I'll touch base on shortly, and then go into more specific detail. So in my opinion, I would focus more on the academic behaviors the first two to three weeks of the class. So you're setting that high expectation and say, wow, uh, Jerry did a great job in bringing some counterpoints to the table in a respectful manner. Or Shannon did a great job in finding external resources beyond the textbook. So thinking about those standards you have for your classes, I would publicly praise those for the first three weeks or so to set the expectation of the classroom. Then we also have private coach. So this is a private message to you and that student um, where there's actually two options here. If you privately coach them by just going to step three, that's a simple redirect. The student will still get credit for their work, but they're just being informed, hey, this is how you can step up for your next week's post and really uh, knock it out of the ballpark. Now, let's say you've been giving the same constructive feedback to that student, yet they haven't adjusted. You can choose to moderate or remove the post from the feed, which sends them an email saying, hey, you need to revise your post for credit. So again, if you're just seeing an academic behavior that you're trying to coach a student on that hasn't been implemented yet, or there's a bunch of other reasons down here too, for instance, um, was direct from homework or study guide, you can also moderate. Again, is, there, is there somewhere we can pull up for if there's an individual student, we can see what we said to them before? Yes. So you have a couple of options. I'll show you my personal favorite. So you can either click on the student name, which obviously it's not here right now, but you can also go to view gradebook. And you can click on this student's name right now because I'm in FERPA compliance mode. It won't allow me. So let me just show you what it looks like. So once I click on the student name, whether it's on the feed or in the grade book, it's going to take me to their discussion post. And this is where your feedback would also show up. And if you gave them public praise, it would be a blue hand. If it was coaching, it would be a red hand. So right now we just preview the post. Um, so you don't have to keep scrolling through a lot of work, but you can click in and then underneath what you would see is your feedback. Great question. And then I just wanna say something for the instructors that are here and then also watching this recording. Uh, this, this coaching and praising, I pretty much never, ever, ever coach. Uh, I, it, uh, I know some people, some instructors that have used it, they really get into coaching a lot and moderating a lot off and it's not needed. They tend to get better and better as it goes along. And then I also have this philosophy of, uh, sometimes in a face-to-face -face discussion, they ask a really dumb question. So, you know, and as an instructor, you're like, oh, wow, well, that was interesting, but let's go see what Susie has to say about this, right? So these, they're not necessarily always going to be like the greatest questions in the world. So, um, but they tend to really be really good. 
uh, and without you doing a lot of work. And that's why I wanted to use pack back because like, I literally will set like a 15 minute timer or like 20 minute timer and just go through and read what I can scroll through. So who's really, you know, up there in those curiosity points. Uh, a lot of the times I let the AI will feature posts for me. A lot of the times mm -hmm. I just let the AI feature the posts for me. Uh, I don't spend much time at all within pack back. And I say this because I, you know, like my, dis my dissertation research uh, did the LMS and pack back. And I looked at the two groups and I had a, I had a, instructors like me who, you know, spent my maybe 15 minutes a week in pack back. And then I had instructors who were spending way more time uh, on pack back than they even did in the LMS. And guess what? participation rates were the same, grades were the same, completion rates were the same, and they were really good, like higher grades, higher completion rates than the LMS. So I guess what I'm trying to stress here to instructors is don't like get too in the weeds with this, like have fun with it. I think it's fun to give praise. Um, but like I said, I don't do it every week. Uh, it just kind of depends. I'm hoping to spend a little more time doing it than letting the AI feature for me now that I don't have so much grading to do. And <laughs> uh, other assignments, I can play in here more and have some more fun here. And so I just really, really wanna caution people, don't spend a bunch of time like coaching and stuff. They're, right. they, they do really well. My participation rates, and I think it's the same for all of Ivy Tech are in the 90%. My okay. curiosity scores, I want to say, on average, are always, even though I've set it at a 45, are always up in the 70s. So, wow. I mean, they really do like this platform without you work, work, working. Okay, Nicole and Sarah, I have a question. It, yes. I just saw this kind of like the old-fashioned discussions you know, that we did previously, that they were discrete for each module. Is this mm -hmm. an ongoing discussion? Like, do do they, like, do they can they respond to module one's questions in module two? Yes. Or yeah, that's what's cool about it too that that counts mm -hmm. for their grades. So if they really, because a lot of the times if you think about it, say module one, you know, we're they're learning a lot about critical thinking and that and how to apply that, and then to political science, and then that introduction of political science. Well, maybe by module three they now are like, wow, I saw that really cool question back in module one that I've now gathered enough information to, to make a cool reply to. They can go back and reply to that. And that's kind of like, and that's kind of the fun of it that these discussions don't end. They're not encapsulated in one module. Like you can actually go back and forth. Yeah, because I noticed the questions were way different than the way I was thinking about the question. Mm -hmm. They're much, much broader and, and actually, yeah, I'll be interested to see because I was thinking about the questions very differently, um, much uh, more specific, like to what extent type questions and, you know, anyway, I have an, uh, another one then. Does, is it graded? Great question. Uh, so let me show you. Yeah. Yeah. So if you recall, when we had um, set up the community, we had a minimum curiosity score of a 45 for questions. So that means... Mm -hmm. If I ask a question, I have to be 45 or above to get that full 15 points. If I ask a question that was 40, that would be below the minimum, so I would get half credit. So our system actually calculates it for you. And so, oh, okay. yes, after your deadline passes, you will receive an email that has um, the participation report and will also provide uh, class insights. So your participation rate, the average curiosity score, which student grew the most? Actually, I realized I clicked very fast. So if you scroll yeah. down to... I'm glad you said which student grew the most because those yes. are the students that I will often go into SpeedGreeter and give them a comment. So I don't yeah. go, I don't go and give feedback in SpeedGreeter very often but I will pick somebody who has really brought their curiosity score up and then I'll go give them feedback and tell them, wow, that's awesome. Or if somebody posted a ton of replies, I'm like, wow, keep that up. Like I love seeing more than just the required two replies. And then yeah. 
sure enough, they'll go and you'll see them constantly doing more than two replies. So. Yep. And so you can also click on that right hand side where it said view gradebook. And when you scroll down, you can see here the point totals. Now for the summer, we, um, we do not have gradebook sync yet. It is coming in the fall. So I know Nicole, um, mentioned that she will support you all during the summer to make sure that you know how to put the grades in for Canvas. Personally, I just type it in manually. It sounds like the columns have already been established in your Canvas shell, but you'll be able to see your student right here. It will tell you the date um, and their points. Now, if you wanted to just, yep. So, sorry, sir. and that's all AI produced, those scores. It's, it's based on the student participation. So we just do the calculations on the back end. It's not necessarily okay. AI on that point, it's oh, just- but, but what I'm trying to say is, I'm not going in right. and generating these grades. Okay, right. okay, great. <laughs> that's what I need no to problem. know. No <laughs> problem. Yeah, no, it, it would be a lot of work. And that's the biggest thing here, as Nicole said, is being, being strategic with how you're interacting with students. So supporting the students that made the most growth or are demonstrating those academic behaviors that you want to set the tone for your class. So again, that's in the view grade book. You can just see our quick dashboard. There's also an option for a CSV. Now, when we do get to the fall term, um, I'm happy to join y'all again to show how to sync those uh, assignments or your pack back discussions to the grade book, similar to how you all did today with Connect. Um, I will also send Nicole a video that goes through the best practices and it breaks it down by section um, just to help, again, have an asynchronous resource in case any questions or, um, you know, if there was something I showed today you wanted more clarity on. But before I head out, any questions that I can assist with? Excellent. Well, I put my email in the chat as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, obviously, Nicole is a great resource, um, but feel free to touch base with me if you have any other questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. It was great meeting y'all. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Thank you, Ted. Um, Jerry, Shannon, thanks for coming too. Uh, I'll hang on for a little bit if you have any additional questions, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording since we've kind of gone through the presentation.